Hi, everybody. I am so, so, so excited. I've been like waiting for this webinar. So I'm super excited um, to be here with Managing Director of Inspired Quill, Sarah Jane Slack, who I had the awesome pleasure of speaking with one-on-one uh, -on -one a couple of weeks ago, and we totally connected and hit it off. And so we're really excited about this and who knows, who knows what else. The point is to grab opportunities when you have them um, and make connections, which is why I am glad that those of you who are here live are here live because Sarah Jane's going to be an awesome resource for all of us. And like to manage expectations there. <laughs> <laughs> She's amazing. She's like, you know, bigger than life. No. <laughs> She's very real. So, like me and, and most of the people that I hang out with. So uh, it's really easy to keep the connection going and freely talk about awesomeness. So let me do the official little introduction and then I'll turn it over to Sarah Jane to, and, and I'll ask some questions and whatnot. Um, <coughs> but I've got it up here on my my sign up page. Okay. Uh, and I love her intro. So Sarah Jane is a social entrepreneur, public speaker, very amateur actress and lover of all things tea related. She splits her time between her day job as a focused mentor, managing the not for profit publishing house inspired quill and thinking up excuses not to exercise. I think I have a whole list of those. <laughs> She's also scarily comfortable talking about herself in the third person and holds the belief that to-do lists breed when your back is turned, which I freaking love because I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, I will let you talk about Inspired Quill because it's very close to your heart and um, you can give it much more much more oomph than I'm sure what, you know, is written there. So uh, welcome, Sarah Jane. I'm so excited. I will hand it over to you. Thank you. So, Fantastic. Well, yeah, my name's... Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Delay. <laughs> um, well, I'm uh, Sarah Jane Slack. Um, and I've been the managing director of Inspired Quill for around five years now. Um, we incorporated on the 5th of April 2011. I did want to incorporate on the 1st of April 2011, but my friends and family told me that I needed to take things more seriously. So April 1st was not a, a date that I was allowed to create a business, apparently. <laughs> um, so before we became a publishing house, we were actually a book review blog. Um, I was doing English at university and I thought, well, if I'm reading these books, I might as well review them. And there were these great things popping up online, book review books. So I decided to get in on that. Um, then when I was doing my master's degree in English, I won an entrepreneur grant at the university and decided to turn Inspired Quill into a publishing house because obviously I had a lot of connections with a lot of authors at that time after being a review blog and um, I was kind of uh, quite pissed off by how much the authors were taken for granted and used as a meal ticket by other publishers so I kind of went how hard can it be to create win-win situations and I've been finding out ever since <laughs> pretty much so that's sort of me and inspired quill in uh, in a bit of a nutshell that's awesome I mean, take inspiration and run with it, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's important in all business, but certainly in publishing where things are changing so much now, you know, you adapt or die. Um, you know, it, it's so important to change with, with what you're doing. So if, if you evolve, that's actually a really, really good thing. Don't fight it. Don't fight eBooks. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And, and self-publishing. Uh, Absolutely. A fan of as well. Yeah, I get, um, I get dirty looks from a lot of the, the publishing industry because Inspire Quill is a, we're very small, but we're a traditional publisher. So 
there's no money that changes hands in terms of the author paying us to do anything. So it's not like vanity publishing or hybrid publishing. Um, we don't give advances, but we give some of the best royalties in the industry. Um, and yeah, I'm all for self-publishing. I think it's fantastic because we as small publishers or publishers generally need to keep on our toes. And if we're not adding value, then what's the point? I think it's a great way for us to constantly be, you know, iterating our processes, getting better, adding more value, whether that's, you know, um, a numbers game financially, which probably won't be the case for a lot of publishers, in Spy Quill included, or the way we do it is more sort of skills development. So we take on primarily debut authors, and we know that in three, four, five years, they might want to go and, and publish somewhere bigger with an actual marketing budget. Um, but it's about helping them to help themselves long term and developing those skills. And we do workshops in disadvantaged areas and stuff like that. So it's very, um, we have a very clear ethos and mission at Inspired Quill, which um, I think a lot of publishers out there kind of miss the mark slightly on. So um, maybe you can cover a little bit about traditional publishing in general, and then maybe smaller traditional publishers mm -hmm. versus like the big, you know, sure. the big sure. names. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So essentially, you can kind of uh, use a, a chart to track traditional to self-publishing. So you have sort of the, the big five traditional, so Random Penguin, Penguin Random House, still say they should have renamed Random Penguin, because it's so much better. <laughs> um, you know, Faber and Faber, Simon and & Schuster, and there are only five big publishing houses in the world. And actually, most of what you would buy from a bookshop um, are imprints of the big publishers. So, for example, um, Del Rey books or Tor or Orbit or you know the, the names that you think oh these are quite small publishing houses well they have their own kind of ecosystem but actually they're owned by the big five it, it's like with any media company they right. say that the world is owned by like 10 companies or something um, so traditionally you would have to pitch your book to an agent the agent would then pitch your book to the uh, publisher, the acquisitions editor. So it's kind of like a double gate, which again is something that really rankles me. Um, and because agents generally take a percentage of what you earn, they're looking for the more commercial things. So if you're writing um, non-commercial genre fiction, um, then you might be in a bit of a bind in terms of trying to find one of the big five to publish your work. Um, so you've got the, the sort of traditional publishing where you get paid per book sold, essentially. Then you go on to hybrid publishing, which is um, you split the cost with the publisher, essentially. So you're both doing some of the work. Vanity publishing and self-publishing is kind of in the same bracket, but with vanity publishing, you pay an external company to print your books and deal with it, and that's you have to pay for it all, but the company does it. Self-publishing, you're doing it all yourself. So what I like to imagine is you have um, less financial input and less control around the traditional publishing, and the more money you put in, the more control you have. Generally, that's you know a very top level generalization, but I find that that's the easiest way to explain it. Um, Inspired Quill falls under the traditional publishing model in that we don't expect any money, we take all the financial risk, um, but we will pay you royalties. Um, and a lot of people I find get a little bit confused because IQ is so small. You know, we're a tiny publisher. It's basically me and three volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm a volunteer managing director myself. It, it's uh, not my full-time job. So, you know, there's this disconnect between indie publishing and traditional publishing. Um, you know, I always say that we're like Penguin, but tiny. 
um, and we actually care about the quality of the work we put out. Um, but that's that's something for another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I know that right now you mentioned to me yesterday that you've got a, a bunch of books um, in the process. Yes. So, <laughs> Say, how does that even work? Like, how does somebody, okay, they've got their manuscript and they're mm -hmm. searching for a way to get mm -hmm. it out into the world. How would they approach you, I guess? Like, how, how does this happen? And do you, do you take everybody? Is there sort of a selective process or how does that work? Sure. So, um, again, this, this process is different uh, in terms of where on the spectrum you want to publish your book. So, Vanity and self-publishing, everything gets gets published. You know, you don't have to be very good or, you know, you don't need to have hired an editor. The typos roam free in a lot of <laughs> vanity and self-publishing. Although I will say in self-publishing, the quality is slowly, you know, increasing, I think, because there are so many people in the game now. Right. Um, you've got to be of a decent quality in order to, um, you know, get anywhere. Well... There are a few, few people who remain nameless who um, don't do that and still get a lot of money, but generally it's good to kind of have that level of, um, that level of quality there. So in terms of traditional publishing with the bigger publishing houses, because so many people want, you know, throw their submissions and want to get published. As I say, they generally go through an agent. So you have your final manuscript and now you have to, it's like with actors, you now need to, hand it over to someone to represent it mm. and they'll put in a good word at a publishing house for you. Inspired Quill and a lot of the smaller publishers have open submissions which means that you don't need this middleman taking a cut of your um, royalties um, in order to publish. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Inspired Quill for example, we're currently opening uh, submissions for, for the entirety of this month. We can only open submissions once a year because we get lots of submissions and we need to go through them all. So um, in that case, what we do is we ask for the first two chapters, the synopsis and a query letter or cover letter, they get called both. Um, and then if we like it, we'll ask you for the full manuscript. If we like that, we'll offer you a publishing deal. So it's, it's a case of this sort of step-by-step -step process. Um, I would say, inspired quill because we only publish around six books a year um we probably only take on around five percent of the the people who send us stuff um and you know that depends on genre as well we only publish certain genres um length of book as well because we use print on demand technology which means that if the book is too long, we lose money per book sold because it costs us more to print it than it does for people to buy it. Um, and yeah, so that, that would, you know, kick off the whole book production process, which for us generally takes around 15, 16 months, hmm. which is a very, very long time compared to a lot of other publishers. Um, but we've found that, you know, that gives us time to really hone the quality of the work, help the author build their brand and their online presence and, you know, uh, take courses. I've developed an online course, for example, uh, which all the Inspired, inspired Quill people get for free. Um, so uh, it's all to do with quality and we know we need that time in order to build the platform, build the quality, make sure that, you know, um, the, the cover's really good. We don't just, you know, get a, a pre-made cover on Canva, although they're very good. Um, you know, it's all custom done for us, essentially. Um, generally, the second time round, the authors know our process. We can get books out a little faster. And we do have authors who come back to us again and again, um, which is fantastic. We had one author who um, got an offer from a, another independent publisher, but a very big independent publisher and turned it down and gave us the book instead, which um, I'm still quite, you know, happy about a year and a half later. Yeah. You know? um, which I think, you know, stands the test of we're doing a pretty darn good job, thankfully. 
Yeah, so. absolutely. So the genres that you accept now, is that going to, is, is that strict? Like you're going to stick with this like forever? Um, because it's fiction, right? Is it yeah, just- well, it's, it's tough to say because to begin with, we just took everything and we tried bits and bobs, but we narrowed down slightly so we could really um, create this level of engagement with the bloggers and the, you know, the networking and the industry, the, right. the events that we go to, that sort of thing. Um, so we cover a lot of the, the sort, sort of genre fiction, if you like, so science fiction, fantasy, uh, YA, um, uh, what else, uh, steampunk, that sort of thing. Okay. But we do also publish literary fiction, um, which is a bit of a, a disconnect, certainly in this industry. Um, we do publish non-fiction as well, although we've only got one of those books so far, um, which is a how-to-write book, essentially. Um, and <laughs> Amy knows about those. <laughs> That's what she's working on right now. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and LGBT fiction as well, something that we're really keen on at Inspired Quill is representation. So I do a lot of talks about um, the importance of representation in mostly fantasy and sci-fi books. Um, but yeah, that, that's something that's incredibly important um, to us. So we try and find authors that, so before any sort of contract is signed, I will have a, a Skype conversation with an author just to make sure that um, we fit as, as a sort of personality thing as well. Mm. Um, I mean, I tend to get on with anyone with a sense of humor, so yeah. that's always useful. But, you know, just making sure that our ethos fits um, is really, really important. And I think, right. unfortunately, a lot of new authors get so caught up in, oh, my God, they, they've given me a publishing contract. First of all, they don't read the contract. Um, when I give a new author a contract, I tell them that they're not allowed to email me with an answer within a week. So they have to go away and read it and they have to initial every single page to, to at least show that they've read every page. Uh Um, So, you know, transparency is a huge issue in, in the publishing industry generally, but it's something that, you know, me and a few of the colleagues that I have from who own other publishing houses are really trying to push forward and, and break those barriers. Yeah. I like that. Um, that you consider it really a relationship with the author. Absolutely. So, I mean, you're spending a lot of time together. I mean, that's like 15 months is, is a good period of time to be in contact. Yeah, I mean, all of, all of the authors know that they can contact me on Skype at 10 o'clock on a Sunday, which has happened more than once. So I speak from experience there. Um, but it, it's just this because it's such a skills development thing, you know, I, a couple of years ago, I went to one of my author's weddings, for example. So, um, you know, we do have a a close relationship that that sort of borders on friendship, but is obviously still professional in that regard. Um, So yeah, it's when you're, and it's a trust issue as well. So I'm the chief editor on a lot of our titles. Um, They have to trust my judgment when I'm editing things. Um, and you know, we'll often have this back and forth about, you know, a certain sentence or a certain phrase or a characterization issue or whatever, but we will collaboratively talk about that because again, it's a skills issue. It's no good me, you know, red penning everything and not giving any explanation or allowing them to grow as writers. Right. So your repeat authors, do they get preference to uh, jumping in on the few books that you actually they work do. with for a year? So uh, repeat authors, basically, there's no submission window for them. They can submit a book whenever they want, essentially. Um, so once you're in, you're in. That's like good stuff. Yeah, although, you know, there have been a couple of times when uh, an author who we've already published has sent me something else and I've gone, mm, no, sorry. Mm. So just because you're published once doesn't mean that you'll automatically get published. It means that you skip to the front of the queue in terms of the submission process. Got it. Got it. So So you're not really in, you're just like (laughs) preferred, (laughs) preferred customer. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) VIP card. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 
<laughs> That's awesome. Um, I like the little story you told me about, and it's it's not really too relevant, but I just like it anyway. The good old boys club of the traditional publishers, um, mm -hmm. just for some comic relief on how that uh, went down for you that one time when you were with your author. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I, I, as I say, I, I do a lot of events, and so I created Inspire Quill when I was twenty two. Um, and certainly the first few years, it's not too bad now that my face is a bit more known. Um, but certainly in the first couple of years, I used to go to events and, um, there was a chap at one event who came up to the stand and it was me and two authors, <coughs> excuse me, and both authors were guys and older than me. And he looks at me and he looks at one of my authors, um, who was it? it was uh, Craig Hallam great chap and he said oh how many times a day do you make her go and get the coffee and Craig looked at Hugo Hugo looked at Craig they both looked at me and Craig went no 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 she's the boss <laughs> he tells us to go and get the coffee um and basically I just saw all the color drain from this guy's face and he walked away and it was quite funny because apparently um, when I was getting coffee earlier on in the day, <laughs> um, I take care of my authors. Um, when I was on a, a lunch run, he'd come over and asked Craig about, oh, who do I need to talk to to get something published? So he obviously came over, started bantering again, and then shot himself square in the foot. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Oh, uh, yes, the good old boys. Yeah. I, I, something that I found out a couple of years ago, I, I'm not sure what the statistics are now, but I was doing a talk at uh, the University of Leicester um, to a, a bunch of students who wanted to get into publishing. And the interesting thing was at the time, 52% of the um, employed publishing industry are women. As I say, this was a few years ago. I, I can't remember the exact year for the statistics. So 52% of women, 14% have director roles. Okay. So you go from 52% to 14%, one four, and only 2% were high director roles. So CEOs, owners, board of directors, that kind of thing. So it goes from 52% to 2%. And most of those 52% are in um, marketing and editorial. Ah. So, but yeah, I, I found that incredibly interesting. Mm -hmm. Incredibly interesting. So you're a rare breed is what you are. You're <laughs> like a unique <laughs> bird, right? <laughs> Not so much anymore. There are, you know, there's, um, I know that there's a girl called uh, Georgina, I can't remember her last name, who owns a poetry press here in the UK called Mud Press. Um, and she's 22. She got to join the 22 club because at the time I was the youngest, but not anymore, yeah. which is, I can't well, I wonder, I wonder out of that, like 15, 14%, how, what the age is, are they older women or young, young ones who are like, no, I think oh. there's certainly in the past two or three years, there's certainly been a surge of, you know, um, people in their twenties doing this uh you know sort of micro presses a lot of poetry presses actually um set up by young people um which is great because you know there's there's definitely a there's still a snobbery around the book industry and all you need to do is ask someone do you prefer paperback or kindle and instantly everyone's got an opinion on that instantly yeah i do um, which is incredibly interesting. My master's dissertation was reader engagement with electronic text. So this was back when the Kindles were just starting to kind of become a big thing. Um, and, you know, I interviewed a lot of people, did a lot of case studies, and, and that was incredibly interesting. But I think something that I'm really trying to bring to the industry, apart from this transparency and actually not treating authors like a meal ticket, is the fact that literature serves a very specific purpose largely which is um you know it allows you to experience things that you wouldn't necessarily experience mm -hmm. you know i'm never going to go into battle with an evil wizard and an orc 
I'm fine with that. I can read about it if I want. Right. Um, and there's just so much snobbery, I think, because of this sort of old, old boys club. And I use that term, you know, fairly loosely. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's really interesting when, once you're in to look around and kind of go, oh, this wasn't what I expected. Right. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, so speaking of Kindles, do you, when you're publishing, is it strictly paperback or do you put out both? No, we put out both. So uh, we publish in paperback and Kindle. Um, and if you catch us at events, you can also get Kobo and PDF copies. Yeah. So yes, basically everywhere, which is, you know, we're not snobbish in that regard. We right. do like paperbacks and we found that actually all the authors want paperbacks of their books because of course you do. It's that sort of heft. Yeah. But um, no, we, we publish across and our, you know, our paperback books, although they're not necessarily front facing on a shelf, you can go into any Barnes and Noble or Waterstones or WH Smith or whatever and order one. Um, we've got incredibly good distribution. So that's, that's fantastic that's for us, thankfully. Yeah. I like how you really work with the authors and training them um, because I did start your course, but I haven't finished it yet. I was hoping to finish it today, but I did not So anyway, I got about halfway through, but I really like the value in um, the ground up, you know, like here's where you need to start. This is what you need to build. This is what you need to work on to, Absolutely. so that when your book comes out, you have people know you already they're getting to know you they've got your you talk about branding you talk about mm -hmm. your message you talk about your ideal reader mm -hmm. um yeah and it's not mystical stuff that's really difficult it's the right. same you know regardless of what kind of content you're you're creating it's a lot like having a business so the focus mentoring with the clients i have it, it's all about cutting the crap and simplifying because you know business is simple it's not easy but the best businesses are really simple um and it really annoys me especially with with other publishers who say we only take on authors who have 5,000 twitter followers well okay but only two of them are engaged right they bought the other you know 4,998 whereas we're more of a you know not even from the ground up, from the foundations. Let's really, you know, dig, dig down, figure out what's working, what's not, where you need to be, um, preventing burnout, making it as easy as possible for you. Um, you know, not just with this book, but with the writing you do in the future. You know, there was a Ben Hennessy who wrote the, who's writing the Queen of the World series. Um, he has said on multiple panels that. Um, if he starts like three sentences with the same word, he hears my voice in his head telling him that he started three sentences with the same word. So, you know, small things like that, it all adds up and, you know, they're transferable skills that that author can then use either in their business or, you know, um, if they decide to go to a different publisher or whatever, you know, um, I was a digital marketing exec in a previous life. So it's all sort of, finding these best practices, stripping out the bullshit, which is prevalent in the corporate world because yeah. rule number one of business, no one knows what they're doing. Rule number two, no one talks about it. Um, and, you know, really making it transparent and, and easy to have that build up. Yeah, I love that because, I mean, I don't, I'm very new to the whole book writing, publishing and all that. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's scary, right? You, you know, right. you go online, how to publish a book, and your brain oh. just goes, oh, I don't want to deal with it. Right. Because, you know, everyone thinks it's this, you know, really secret, elite kind of, you know, Virginia Woolf was self-published. Hmm. You know, essentially, her husband's press. You yeah. know, it's, it, it's fine, but just own it. And I think the lack of communication and also the people who want to communicate with you, but steer you in a certain direction, you know? So with me, for example, I say traditional publishing is great. Inspired Quill is great. But at the same time, here are the benefits of self-publishing over traditional publishing, you know, and being very open with that and trusting people to make their own decisions. 
there's a huge lack of trust in the industry, which really annoys me. Again, I get very annoyed. <laughs> right. So um, I lost my train of thought because my phone started ringing because I forgot <laughs> to turn it down. Um, does anybody have any questions that they can think of that they know of right now? And we can we can start doing some Amy. Amy, go ahead and unmute yourself. Can you? Right. Hi, Sarah Jane. Hello. So what I had messaged you about earlier was um, something that's come up with our authors a lot. Um, that's spreading the word. And so our conversation was starting about blogs. If mm -hmm. you were just, you know what you want your book to be about, what should be your first step when looking for blogs? Is it as simple as Googling like health? related blogs for somebody who wants to connect yeah i mean i think it depends on how you want to promote so you know certainly within what inspire quill does you know you've got author interviews you've got guest posting you've got reviewing that sort of thing so using google as specifically as possible to say okay so my book is a i don't know um lgbt fantasy book for example um, you can say, okay, LGBT or and fantasy blogs um, write for us, in quotes, for example, and that will pull up the write for us pages of all the blogs. So that means that you can be very specific straight from the off and not spend, you know, 20 hours of your life going through blog lists because it happens and sometimes you do end up doing that. Um, you know, top googling top 10 best fantasy blogs or top 10 best because everyone's got a top 10 best list use it to your advantage mm -hmm. um so yeah it as i say it depends because some bloggers will only review some will happily interview an author um the lead times as well you know sometimes it can be three four months in advance of your book being published that you need to send them a review copy um so you know one of the reasons why Inspired Quill has such a long lead time is to factor all of this in um, and, you know, get people on board and all publishing on, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of the week the book comes out, for example, which is really useful because you keep that momentum. Does that make sense? Yeah. What is, what did you say? Right for her, right for, right for us. So um, in good, I can't remember exactly how you do it, but you can look for very specific heading tags so i think it's if you put something in quotes so you can put um book review blogs and then in in quotes open for submissions it will only show those pages of the book review blogs that are open for submissions does that make sense yeah um, yeah as i said i can't remember exactly how you, i need to brush up on my google foo i think but um it's it's possible to sort of play around with it but you know to, to answer your question yes it, it's just a case of whoop, just a case of um dropping everything today uh, <laughs> uh, just a case of uh using google and just refining your search as much as possible that's great and then you don't send the whole book or you just send because you said so about sending i would cards. normally send a pitch letter so if you Im imagine that you're just writing for a, a, a blog for example, and you want to guest post on a blog, you send them a pitch. So a lot of book review blogs will have a submissions process and say, you know, things like, you know, we only accept this genre, get in touch with this person, you need to tell us this information. Um, a lot of them are very good with that. If they don't have that, you know, just a friendly, hi, saw your blog, thought you might like this because of X, Y, Z, um, you know, try and build that that rapport a little bit in the first email um, I would never send unless they ask specifically for it I would never send a copy of the book um, without them asking for it because that's quite presumptuous um, I back when IQ was a book review blog I got stuff from a, a, a lot of the big publishers I've got a um, a Hillary Mantle bring up the bodies advanced reading copy that I've never read because I didn't ask for it um, you know so it's it, it happens even with the, the big guys um, so yeah I, I would say get in touch with them but be as specific as possible and also figure out what your um, 
what your bar is set at. So, um, you know, the 80-20 the rule, you know, the Pareto principle, which states that 80% of your outcome comes from 20% of your effort, right? So don't air quote waste time on blogs that have five followers and, you know, 20 people looking at it. Spend time on the big blogs that will get you the most out of it. Um, you know, smaller blogs definitely have their place in terms of, you know, warming up, figuring out how you pitch things, that sort of thing. And sometimes it's great to kind of have that look on and go, you, you're not big yet, but you're going to be huge. I like you, you know, and, and sort of building up from there. Um, and it's great to kind of keep that relationship because in the future, when you bring out your second book, they will remember you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so know where your bar is set at. Is it in terms of page views? Is it in terms of their Twitter following? How engaged they are is something that I would always consider. I don't care if a blog says it has, you know, 10,000 subscribers. I will scroll down to the posts and see how many people are commenting because that's what I care about as, you know, as a, a way of kind of figuring out the ROI that I'm going to get, not just from the the cost of sending out a paperback book, if that's what they re request, we always try and push ebooks onto them because it doesn't cost us anything to send. Um, but also in terms of my time, because, you know, I'm, I'm a, a freelance um, focus mentor. Um, you know, I, I've got clients to, to, to help, but also I'm running a publishing house by myself. We've got eight books coming out in the next two years. Well, this year and next year. Um, my time is more valuable to me really than money. So find your level and, and, and stick to it. I would say as well with blogs. Mm -hmm. Love it. Thank you. No worries. And, um, this is what I was thinking of before I got distracted by a ringing <laughs> phone. <laughs> Amazing how quickly I can be distracted. Sometimes <laughs> a lizard will do it. You know, I see a lizard <laughs> outside and I'm like, Oh, look at the lizard. So, <laughs> Anyway, um, you work the same um, with people who aren't local. Like, are most of your authors local? Are you international? Does it matter? Um, no, is the, it really doesn't matter. Um, I mean, I was based in Derby, which is in the Midlands of the UK. I'm now based in Oxford in the UK. And at the end of next month, I will be based in Madrid in Spain. So, you know, Inspirequill goes wherever I go. I use Skype a lot. Um, and I say that to work with as an author has to have Skype because that's how we communicate. Um, you know, I'm very, I'm hands-on in, in the sense that I like having that touchstone with people. But at the same time, um, it's really important that the authors are also self-starting. So I will say, if you've ever got any questions, comments, queries, want to talk about anything, need to be talked down from killing a character, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, I've only threatened not to publish a book once if they killed a certain character. <laughs> I, was, I was mostly joking, but it happened. Um, we all have our favourites. Everyone will right. tell you, you don't, but we do. Um, you know, so we have authors in, in uh, England, Ireland, uh, a couple in America and uh, one in New Zealand. Yeah. So that time difference is interesting. Uh, lots yeah, of yeah. Late nights and early mornings, but it's, it's completely worth it, you know, completely. Um, yeah. The, the sort of uh, work that we managed to achieve together and then to see them go on and improve with each subsequent, you know, publication is, is absolutely fantastic. So we work very internationally. Um, of course, there are limitations. So, for example, I can't pick up the phone and call someone in, in um, you know, uh, in uh, Dunedin in New Zealand, for example, where one of our authors is located. Um, but I can do that in the UK. So, for example, uh, Anne Goodwin, who wrote Sugar and Snails, I've just got her um, a couple of events here in the UK because I was able to pick up the phone and, and do that. Um, so, you know, there are limitations in, in that regard. And I think marketing, obviously, legwork is, is a big thing for our authors. Um, so for me, because I am but one person, unfortunately, trying to figure out a way around that, but so far I've been unsuccessful. Um, 
you know, it's important for them to, to take on some legwork as well, but it's not, yeah, you go and do that. It's your, it's your deal. It's let's discuss how we can do that, what you need help with, what you would prefer me to do, what you can do, etc. There's actually a big sort of slight segue here. There's, there's a big um, myth in the publishing industry that if you get published by one of the big five, you will have billboards everywhere. Um, you'll go to all these swanky events. Your book will be on display everywhere. It's not the case. The big five publish thousands and thousands and thousands of books every year. You know, uh, a Barnes and Noble or a Waterstones only has so much shelf space. And also, um, you're expected to go to events at your own cost. So you have to pay for stuff. The marketing budget, unless you're Stephen King, J.K. Rowling, and they know your book is going to sell very commercially, your marketing budget is very low and it's very hands off. No one in the big publishing houses has time to teach you how to go from the foundations up. Mm. So, you know, that's something that we're very proud of. You know, we don't have the financial budget, but we have, you know, I spend, you know, a good five, six, seven hours a day sort of doing, you know, different things and yeah. So. so that's good. So people like say somebody here in the state, I mean, Sorsha's in Ireland and she spends time in Australia too. So wow. she's a she's international, a international, right? Um, say somebody here in the States, do you have like resources for them to look for how they can market or promote themselves in person kind of? Yeah. So I mentioned the, and um, you, uh, mentioned the the course that I developed and that was for basically for the inspired quill authors first and foremost and if anyone else would like to buy it then that money goes directly into inspired quill which is a not-for-profit so it doesn't line my pockets it goes actually back into the business uh, we do a lot of charity work as well in terms of um, sometimes a book you know 10% of the profits from a book will go to a certain charity okay and um, you know we do as much of that as we can um, in terms of resources, that's something that, you know, I have a lot of documents and, you know, we'll have Skype training and stuff like that. And I'm just starting to put all of that into actual structured e-courses. Um, but yeah, you know, we, we have chats quite a lot and, you know, I'll say, okay, so send me a list of what you're thinking of doing. We'll go through it together. We'll add, we'll subtract, we'll figure out what the best use of your time is, where I can help you you know, where it'll take me five minutes and it might take you two hours, let me do that because that's my area of expertise, etc. cetera. Um, it's all, of, a lot of it is about time management, to be perfectly honest. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why I kind of sidestepped into focus mentoring as well, because first of all, I, I love it to a quite a silly degree, absolutely <laughs> love it. But it's, it's so similar between being a content creator and author and you know running a business certainly entrepreneurs mm -hmm. that the overlap absolutely phenomenal of course now a lot of entre entrepreneurs are going ah self-publishing isn't so much of a dirty word anymore self-published books can actually be quite good and lend me a lot of credibility hmm so you know that's that's all really good yeah, yeah. that's that's great i love that because well because you work like you said with a lot of brand new authors and yeah. That's who Amy and I are working with in the Women Wisdom Writers program, our brand new authors. So it's really mm -hmm. a step-by-step -step process, which is, mm -hmm. which is what I love about how Amy developed that is that it takes the, you know, because there is a certain amount of anxiety and fear, I yeah. think, around like, oh shit, like I'm writing this book, now what? Like, how do I go, how do I even, first of all, how do I get it from here? onto paper then and then what happens how am i going to share it mm -hmm. with the world so i love that the way you work is mm -hmm. a little bit more hand holding than like the big companies and it's not as scary mm -hmm. and, um, it still get it gets done in a very effective manner yeah, i mean i think you know a lot of it is about creating a safe environment to fail so a lot of my authors do events and, and you know sell maybe one or two books Sometimes it doesn't happen very often, thankfully, but you know, it sometimes happens and you know, they'll come back and be like, Oh, I only sold this many. It's like, yeah, but how many people are going to go away and remember you? How many people did you talk to? Oh, about 50. 
oh, that's great, so that's 50 people who will now remember you. There was a chap, Matthew Munson, who was our first author. Um, he was telling me yesterday, um, he's also one of my focus mentor clients, which is quite cool. Um, so we were talking yesterday about um, the fact that he did an event and a woman came up to him afterwards and said, you were the chap I was talking to last year at the Nine Worlds convention and I couldn't remember your name. Um, can I buy both of your books? You know, so it took, it took a year, but that level of engagement is so, so critical that, you know, she then went, oh yeah, I'll do this. And, you know, you mentioned handholding, which it is in a way, but it's also... I don't want any of my authors to be reliant on me. And I mean that in the best way in terms of I want them to be self-sufficient enough to have this sort of safe space to, to fail and do things and try things out because a lot of the publishing industry is dying because they just do the same shit all the time. <laughs> um, and I don't want to say they deserve to die out, but they deserve to die out. <laughs> um, just, you know, business and life. Um, but to, to have that space and then go, okay, do you know what? I can, I can take this and run with it, you know? And for me, that's fantastic. Getting to the stage where I'm not needed anymore is actually really cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, I love my job and I've served the authors in a way that really resonates and is really useful as opposed to just saying, give me your book. Let me, you know, throw it through spell checker, slap a, a pre-made cover on and throw it on Amazon, which a lot of digital first publishers do because that's where all the money is. Right. They can produce faster and just. Yeah. yeah. There was a, there's a small publisher who naming no names, but they publish about 250 books a year. And you got to wonder for a small team, how, how quality those books are. Some of them are probably really good, but you know, it's, it, it just depends where you are on the scale. If that's what they want to do and they, and the readers enjoy it, then that's fine. Go for it. Right. But, you can have lots of different missions within the industry and I don't think any of them are necessarily better than any others. Inspire Quill is the best, of course, but apart from Inspire Quill, which sits up here, all the others can fight over whatever. <laughs> I say that with firmly tongue in cheek. If anyone from any other publishing house... <laughs> You're going to be blacklisted. I love you all. <laughs> you know I love you all. Uh. I think that's fantastic. I, well, I vow personally, well, like anything, you know, some people with coaching or um, publishing. And I think there's like so many options for people. I feel like an airline when I say this, we know you have a choice. Thank you for yeah. choosing us. Yeah. You know, like. <laughs> but it, it comes to choice paralysis. And because there are so many options, you know, you spend time Googling for, you know, three years of your life instead of just going out, trying something. Okay, it didn't work. What's the next thing? Yeah. Um, and it's something that I find like the, as I said before, the overlap between my focus mentoring work and with entrepreneurs, um, normally around the sort of setup, what do I do next kind of stage, the kind of level that I work with. And certainly first time authors is absolutely incredible because you know you go okay so you've got 20 different things you you suffer from shiny object object syndrome like so many of us entrepreneurs right um you've got 20 things you can do okay what's the one thing that you need to do in order to get the biggest result everything else can wait what's the one thing you need to do cut the crap get shit done and just you know move forward essentially and it's that forward motion once you start but it's the starting that is really tough. Yeah. And that's why it's so great to have somebody. I mean, that's, that's now maybe you all can kind of see why Sarah Jane and I are like compatible because we both get shit done and we both kind of like that process of the impact. What do you need to get done first and then keep moving? You know, we may have some collaborations. We've already kind of, Absolutely. About, Absolutely. Uh, I mean, so we're going we're gonna to tackle people from both sides of the world. <laughs> we're like, wrap it up. We're going to get shit done all over from the world. to here. <laughs> That's right. But there's, there's a great quote by um, a chap called Gary Vaynerchuk, who um, is quite sweary, but I absolutely love him. I love his energy. And he said that ideas are shit. Execution is the game. 
And I, I see that a lot in, in both camps, you know, with entrepreneurs, but with authors, oh, I've got this great idea for a story, but they never write it. Right. You know, they will start 20 different stories and never finish anything, yeah. you know, and it, and, oh, I've got writer's block. Oh, whatever. You know, I don't really agree with writer's block. I don't think it's a thing, but you know, it's, it's just one of those, like, everyone's got ideas. So don't be everyone actually do shit. Yes. Agreed. Totally agreed. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I like um, what I was going to say a few minutes ago too, was that I, I value personally the learning experience. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a big do it yourselfer. Um, you know, I'm not this big wig in the, the way upper echelons of uh, mm -hmm. coaching or anything like that. So I do most things by myself, but I, I love to look back and say, oh my God, like I learned how to do this and then I can help other people how to do this. So I like that with your authors that you're teaching them, like you said, from the foundations, mm -hmm. from digging in deep and building up so that they already have those skills so that the next book and the next book and the next book just happens quicker because they've already, they've already learned how to do this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, so important and as i say all of our authors have decided to republish through us instead of going elsewhere you know they could have gone oh thank you for all of these you know nice skills and know how and i can navigate the industry now bye right they don't. so you know and it i think that goes to show as well that you can give away so much value and but people value the value you give you right. know it's it's all about creating win-win situations there in there are enough you know douchebags in the world <laughs> yes. for people to go oh actually you know you're quite genuine authenticity is a big word i know but you're you're quite genuine in the fact that you want to help me i like you i'm going to stick with you yeah yeah <laughs> I, I, love, I value that too i think that's huge that no like trust factor mm. that you build with people and Absolutely. you don't get that if if you're and I'm I'm really starting to learn this and practice it and getting out there more um it's not something that happens overnight but if you hide behind the computer or you know mm -hmm. back in the shadows like I like to do <laughs> You know, nobody's going to get to know you. They don't get to know your personality. They don't get to say like, Hey, Oh my God, I would really love to work with this person because, mm -hmm. because they're, they're genuine. I feel like really comfortable talking to them and I feel, um, I trust them and I know that we can, we can do this stuff together. Um, so yeah, getting books out mm -hmm. there is awesome. And then you're accomplished. So don't sit on it. I just, I did a little video on this actually the other day about hoarding your ideas and how it benefits mm -hmm. nobody. It doesn't benefit you. You make no money off of hoarding your ideas. It doesn't benefit somebody else who's sitting there waiting for what exactly what you have to offer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love, I'm like all energized right now. Good. Good. Go and write a novel. Go. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. You're the host. Don't tell, you're the host. Amy, don't tell Amy. Shh. Cause she'll be on my ass after this. <laughs> she will. She's very good at prodding. <laughs> I like the idea of ghost writing actually, you know, like just throw it at somebody like Amy and just let her do it. <laughs> She's brilliant at that. Um, <laughs> Does anybody else, we're almost at the hour, so I want to make sure if anybody else has any questions that they wrote down or they want to have covered that, um, that we absolutely do that. So if anybody does, just unmute yourself if you can or raise your hand. Sorsha. Hi. Hi, Hiya, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Good. I have really enjoyed this and taken so much in, so thank you. Good. I'm glad. Um, I don't think I so much have, has a question, it's a question, but when you said about the, you know, if you start a sentence three times, that I'm now, I have my book printed off as the girls know for me to go through it. And I'm like, oh no, I know I'm going to have to change so many sentences and how this starts. So I was, that's going to ring through my ears now. <laughs> it's really interesting because 
you know, something that I really adopt to is the fact that every book is different. And sometimes it enhances the book if you start every sentence in a paragraph with the same word. But the issue is the fact that a lot of editors as well don't read the book as a reader. So I'm more than happy to let grammar kind of, you know, bend the rules slightly if it reads better. Because at the end of the day, you'll want to read the book. I don't care if it's you know, supposedly a semicolon or a colon, as long as I, well, I do, but, you know, it, it's that kind of, we read books to enjoy them. Mm. You know, at, at the end of the day, you read books to enjoy them and, um, you know, get something out of it and live better the life and escape or whatever. Um, I mean, how many books have you read that actually... You couldn't. You didn't really want to read, but you kept going. Oh no! Uh, yeah. I, I no. I tend to if it if it doesn't grab me, I'm like no. So this this is time I'll not. This is time I'll not get back. So no. <laughs> but that's, <laughs> that's fantastic because so many people, and especially with the classics, go. Oh, I really need to read this. Yeah. I was in a production oh. of uh, Pride and Prejudice a couple of years ago here in Oxford, and I was like, I should really read the book all the way through. If I'm if I'm in the play, I've got to read the book all the way through. I got about two thirds of the way through and went, do you know what? I'm not enjoying it. I don't, I don't care enough. Like, I love it. I had a, I had a, a, a friend, when I say a friend, she's a lady I know, she's a nun, she's 75 and she has this book she's been raving about. You must, you have to read it, Sorsha. It's just life changing. I got to page 149 and I thought, oh, you know, this is not for me. So then I met her for coffee and I said, oh, here's your back. Did well, wasn't it great? And of course, I couldn't lie to her. So I yeah. said, no, I got to page 149. That was it. It was enough. I couldn't read past it. And it, I just couldn't. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. It has to grab my attention. Absolutely. And now I wish I'd have paid more attention in English class. Now when you're <laughs> speaking. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. I've got lots from you today. So yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. Lovely to meet you. Yeah, likewise. Likewise. Thank you. Good luck with your move. Cheers. Yeah, I think I'm going to need it. I'm going to go over when I'm uh, end of June, which is apparently one of the, the, the start of the heat wave. So last nice. year, my partner sent me a WhatsApp that mentioned you know, 48 degrees outside, you know, a picture of this outside the month, 48 degrees. I'm like, that's not heat, that's fire. My face <laughs> is going to melt off. <laughs> Madrid. Uh, yes. Yeah, nice. we, shall see. we shall see. Beautiful. You know, the great thing about owning a publishing house and doing focus mentoring is do it from anywhere. And that's one of the great, another great thing about print on demand as a publishing route. Um, you know, if anyone's thinking of self publishing, just remember that if you do print runs, it's always good to have a box of books with you because who knows who's going to turn up for tea that you can foist one on. But <laughs> you know, having a print run of 500, do you have space for those? And if you don't sell 200 of them, what are you going to do with them? So, um, you know, a, a lot of vanity publishing uh, is print run rather than print on demand. So if you're thinking of self-publishing, definitely, you know, how the books are going to be brought into the world is something to definitely look at. That's a great point. Yeah, you don't want your garage full of or your attic or wherever full of boxes of books that you're like, oh, my God, like... <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm sorry, to begin with, but after three years. <laughs> yeah. Feels like old news by then. You probably wrote another book and you're like, ah, the first one, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, awesome. Oh my God, I loved this call. So I want to put it out there again. Anybody else have any questions? You can certainly just uh, mm -hmm. unmute yourself real quick and hop in and yell in case I'm talking. I want and, uh, to sure just, that... just something else as well. If, if you're not comfortable asking, a, there, first of all, there are no such thing as stupid questions because you only know what you know, right? Second of all, if you're still not comfortable asking a question here, um, you know, you can always feel free to email me. Um, if you Google Sarah Jane Slack, um, I'm like the first three pages of Google. So you can find me somehow. <laughs> I'm on Facebook and Twitter and, um, uh, I've got my focus mentoring website or through inspired quill or whatever. Feel free to send me a message at any time. Or if you go away and think, Oh, I should have asked that. 
Yeah. And see you yeah. both. Because <laughs> I'll probably have another question. You know, like I think of a lot of brilliant things, like when I'm getting ready. Um, oh, yeah. I'm in the, uh, the shower and stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, shit, I need to record this stuff. So, yeah, I come you up with You can actually get um, writing things in a shower that you can stick to the wall. I've and heard of those. And you can write on it. It's like the best thing. I've not got one, but I really want one. I've heard of them. I've heard of them too. Yeah. I think I might have to invest in one. <laughs> see how that works. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, Amy and I, okay, this is, this collaboration is so awesome because it's all about uh, first time authors and Amy and I have our program, uh, Women Wisdom Writers Round Two, starting on Monday, um, which is fantastic. Because it, like I mentioned a little bit, you know, it was, it's a step-by-step -step process and you get two coaches and you get weekly calls. So really for the value of it, um, it's I was, I was surprised by, by the value of it actually yeah. from what I've seen out there with other, um, you know, other people doing things and charging, you know, 10 grand for 30 days. It's yeah. crazy. So. This is a very high value. I Absolutely. have to say, I, you know, I'm not patting myself. No, I mean, we're, we're both, we both love what we do in our areas of expertise, and I think it really shows in the group, and re we really want people to get their ideas out there, um, so uh, we're at book and tinyurl.com slash book in 90 days is more information on that, and then they can find you at www.inspired-quill.com. Yeah. Information for that and like Sarah Jane said Facebook and Google Hirsch comes up really quickly <laughs> so I don't think yeah. there's too many Sarah Jane slacks out there just like Charisse Boucher's I think yeah it's it's quite useful I'm, I'm named after a Doctor Who character but my parents decided to give me a Y and add a hyphen so you know I've, well, I've got a bit of a, a one-up from you know the the more conventional way of saying Sarah Jane. I'm Sarah Jane, so it's kind of oh, a bit. Okay, I've been saying it wrong this whole time. I guess that's oh, my American right. accent. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter watches Doctor Who. Nice. Um, and I have I have gotten sucked into it a, a few times myself. I'm guilty. I make fun of some things like those Daleks. I just can't stand them. But anyway, totally off off topic here. I want to end this call. And thank you so, so much for your time. Thank, thank you for you. having me. It's been fantastic. And thanks to everyone who, uh, who rocked up as well. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to me rant about things. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you, Sharice, as well. Oh, my gosh, you're welcome. And there, I'm going to send out a replay. So if anybody awesome. you know, wants to share, share the replay, please do, because um, yeah. it's a lot of great information in here. And, and Sarah Jane, Sarah Jane is so awesome. <laughs> now I'm going to catch myself every time uh, for giving us access to her brain and her wealth of knowledge. I'm, I'm so excited about this connection. Everybody have a wonderful day and wonderful weekend that's coming up. And don't sit on your ideas. Don't hoard them. Get shit done. Get shit done. That's what we're doing. <laughs> Thank you.